third. He'll probably end up winning the CrossFit Games. Me? Yeah. That dude? Yeah. How are you doing? Putting oil in it. It's got a leak. Yeah. Just really. Oh yeah, real bad. That's the price you pay for it on an old car. It leaks oil. This engine's really notorious for leaking oil. That's why you bought it. Yeah. <laughs> just want to just want to keep yourself busy. When it gets bad enough, I'm gonna just take the engine out and replace it with another newer one. Like a hybrid or something. <laughs> <laughs> day three. Day three. Final day. Um. And yesterday's vlog, Heat One's P score system came in for some criticism in some corners. Um, the general consensus was it's great they're trying something new. Why are people getting zeros? It's Ten got guys got zeros, zeros and they finished the event yeah. within the cap, but they got zeros. Yeah. To me, the cap's arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. If you're comparing me, if I'm in the same field as Rich Froning, Noah Olson, Matt Frazier, and I'm doing Fran with them, they're all gonna do it in two minutes and 20 seconds probably. And I'm gonna do it in four minutes. Do I deserve a score? What's the time cap? Doesn't matter. <laughs> we can, everybody's allowed to finish. Do I deserve a score? Is it just you four or five? No, there's 30 other guys. And okay. they're all pros. Well then yeah, it's a sliding scale. I kind of feel like if you do it, if there's no time cap or if there is a time cap and you do it, you should at least get like one, one point. It wouldn't have mattered. They weren't going to get a score even if there weren't a time cap. So explain, explain how so many people got a zero. The guy in first could have done the workout twice before they did it once. Okay. And so they were outside of the range of basically points because I base it like it's a straight like points per second. And so after they fall out of that hundred point range those seconds there's just no points it's kind left of cut line at the games yeah you're outside that it's that you can line. think about it as a minimum work requirement it's yeah, just okay. a sliding minimum work requirement based on the field did anybody get a zero yesterday that yeah. completed the workout yeah. for the same reason yeah. and it was because the top 15 men there was a minute and a half between the top 15 men the top half of the field which puts the all the available points within a three minute scale so as their guys were way outside that range. It's like, sorry, you yeah. weren't. Did anybody complain directly? It was anybody like, there's a mistake, I got zero, but I shouldn't have. Did anybody like, not understand that it was a different point system? No. Nobody? No way. I do feel bad about it, but I think it's because they don't fully understand how it's calculated, so they don't have the footing to argue. Okay. I And I wish that they didn't feel that way, but I can't teach everybody the whole thing. The, you should just bring like a whiteboard around with you. I've thought about just like drawing it <laughs> and being like, just walk away. Yeah, that would go down really well. That was hard. Um, normal, I mean, like I love that workout. I think it's a great CrossFit test, like just 100, 100, 100, 100. It's really like who can suffer and hang on. Um, so it's really gritty. I like that. Um, I don't feel like personally, like I'm just not where I've been in the past. Um, but I'm on my way. So that was kind of like a good like, okay, you're fit, but you still have a little more room to... Are you closer to, than you thought you were or further away? Um, on certain things I'm closer, and then on other things I'm like, okay, I got a little time. It just like a lot of like my power and strength are kind of missing, which I think kind of like then pours into everything else I'm doing, right? Because then I'm like, I'm like, oh, you're just not there. Like, and, you know, and I try to, so it's a mind battle right now like I'm kind of like you're you're not good no you're really good you're not good you're really good so it's a lot of that I don't know I mean like yeah I don't feel far off you know like I kind of surprised myself yesterday on the thrusters like my all-time thruster is 175 right so just like I didn't think I'd finish but I honestly thought I was just gonna finish the third bar and then I hit three at 165 so I was like okay I'm not too far off from something like that and that's a pure strength test right like there it's like you either do it or you don't um like where a lot of the other lifts are like kind of luck snatch clean and jerk sometimes you just get lucky 
see and oh we catch God. it and we're like, holy shit. Don't know how it got there. Yeah. Uh, but with like the thruster, it's just like pure strength. So yeah, just like certain things. I think I'm just having a little more trouble. Like we don't have a lot of help at home. So I'm always watching the baby. Um, and therefore I'm not training, you know, four hours today like I used to. And it's more like an hour. Um, and I think that's hard to accept. Um, but the fact that I'm just doing that and I'm getting fitter, it's kind of cool. That's how you do you post people like Like how I approach, um, other people train, you know, like, do you feel that it's not necessary to do four hours, or do you feel that It really depends. I don't think it's necessary, but I think what it does is it builds a lot of confidence, right? Um, I mean, I've done a lot of stunt work as well, and I'm just kind of the person that has always benefited off of high volume and repetition. The more reps I do, the more, like, the more confident I am, and when you're confident, that's dangerous. So it's like kind of like one of those things. Do I think you need to? No. But <laughs> but if, you, if that's what makes you walk out on the onto the floor thinking like I got this, then why not? Let's go, Haley. Push. Dig deep, girl. Good, Haley. Do you hear him when he's shouting? Oh, I hear him. <laughs> and right, like, and he he gets fired up. He, and like he honestly, me, as the workout got deeper, he probably got louder and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should have seen him when I finished the uh, snatch ladder at West Coast Classic, because like in 20, like when it was first out, I got like maybe the minimum requirement on the first bar. Yeah. And I mean, he was like fired up. And honestly, if I could tell every, all these young athletes one thing, I'm like, find a small circle and find people that cheer you on like that. show up to own competition, you don't need a huge camp. You just need a small little circle that is like that. Like that just gets that fired up when you're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think and I think that is getting kind of like looked like looked over a little bit. Like as like all these camps like grow. Um, you know I think if I could say to all the young athletes one thing is like find a small group of people the ride because it's so cool when you hit these little like milestones you know um i don't really know if we're supposed to be speaking on it but we are helping someone out um and we are just trying to encourage her and bring her back to where she just loves it and she's having fun i mean Oh, 100%. I think I've been around so long, and I've been coached um, by one coach specifically, but I've had a couple, and I just know exactly what an individual athlete needs. Um, and then Josh and I, like, we've been studying all the science behind all the training and stuff for years, um, and I'm someone that's been applying it, and he's someone that is, like, he is in the books, like, you know, he's very smart, um, but we also have like another career outside of CrossFit, and I think we're just kind of doing it because we love it. Um, and I think when you're doing something because you love it, you just look at it differently. You know, like for us, it's not about the money. It's not about getting followers. You know, it's really just to help people. Um, and I think for me, just taking this last season off, you know, I was able to train with Bethany Flores and like push her along during uh, quarterfinals, semifinals, and I think there's a place for me in that, like in being a leader. Um, Cause like, I'm really, you know, I've like failed a lot in CrossFit. Um, and I think that's what kept bringing me back, but it's built this like just a different outlook. You know, like I get, I do it because I love it. I do it cause I like to do hard things. Yeah. You know, and it's that simple. And I think when you look at it like that, you'll be around a lot longer. You know, and I think if more athletes, especially the young ones, can look at it like that, they'll have a long career. Like, look at Beck of Weight. Like, I mean, that's insane. Alessandra Pacelli, like, just to be able to be fit for that long and to be able to hang, that to me is way more impressive than someone that comes out for like a couple years and does something. You know, it's like CrossFit's not that big yet. You know, it's, it's getting there, 
you know, I know it's, <laughs> it's had its like up and downs, but it's on its way, you know. Um, but really, like, it just builds like a different type of person, you know, if you do it right. Oh, goodness. You ever seen this? No. Here. Just put it on your leg. What's that? It's for polishing tires. Yeah, it's a it's a car buffer. Where did you get the idea for that? Is that a common thing? I I don't know. Am I weird for having not seen it before? I don't know. It's like I mean, you think about like these like Theraguns and like all this all these tools. Yeah. They're like hundreds of dollars. I think I picked this up at the auto parts store for like eight bucks. It does the same exact and thing. Just because the revolutions are so slow that it's not going to have to damage you. But Correct. So your legs slow the down to go but it's just kind of vibrating. It's like a little bit of um yeah it's like percussive. Yeah. So it does the same job. It just doesn't it has one setting. So it's either on or off. And how's your weekend going? Okay. Has it back to work better? Uh I'm I've been dealing with a back injury for like seven weeks. So I'm happy with where it's at. This weekend, the workout starts and it's like I don't feel it, which is nice. Until so you love uh, back up competing. Right now. Yeah. After the games in 21, I had a, a pretty significant hip injury. Uh, it took me out for about probably six months, and I didn't really have time to like catch up to. So I finished the quarterfinals that year in like 49th place or something like that, outside of the cut. And then last year, I did a lot of rehab. Last year, everything got kind of better. And uh, I ended up in 28th this year. Uh, so I got to semifinals. The weekend of semifinals, I went to training think tank to do the workouts. And between Wednesday when I got there and Thursday morning, I had some sinus, you know, my kids brought the undefeated virus home from school and I was just not in a good place to compete that weekend. So Kyle, who I'm competing against, he's my coach. He's been my coach for four years. So. Huh? You're willing him to fail. I'm willing him to fail, yeah. It's a little bit of where I am now and it's a little bit of, it's a great opportunity. Year that JR is doing masters. Um, you know, having been the, the competition director for MFC, you know, I want to see masters events thrive, whether they're elite athletes or they're, you know, everyday athletes. Um, so the opportunity to come out here and kind of like see how he's doing it um, and have conversations with him about it is the real reason that I'm here. Yeah, and he has, I, I like that it's a, uh, minus some of the aspects, swimming, things like that, um, it's a really games-like competition. You know, we have these implements that, you know, people are like, oh, they're not safe, or oh, they're, but like, it just takes a little bit of training, right? The flip sled, um, you know, that's a great implement. It's a great implement for gyms to have. Pegboards, another great implement. You know, floating Toto bar. Those, those, those pull-up bars have been on Rogue's website for like 10 years. Yeah. And this is the first time I've ever seen them in a competition. 30 reps to go in lane five. You're so sneaky. I, don't, I never know. I never know what direction it's like. You're going on broken on everything workout according to Taylor. Uh, that, w that was his advice and I trust him so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So never drop any implements. Trust the game plan. Trust the preparation. Trust your fitness. <laughs> How are you going to jump and move the box? Just jump with the box in your hands? Yeah. Okay, yeah. As 
as it's turning and jumping over it. Perfect. Yeah. So it's taller. Yeah. The judge is going to move her forward while she continues to jump. Yeah, okay. So you're, just, you're just going to shout, now, while you're mid-air. Yeah. And do a really big jump. <laughs> Um, what's Taylor like as a coach? Is he as big a dick as he is as a person as a coach or is he more professional? This is our first competition together. Um, with time under our belt, he knows me a little bit better than um, quarterfinals. Um, he's very supportive in what I need. And um, he's, I think he's more, he's more, he's more cerebral than people think he is as well. Oh, absolutely. People, people, I think pe people rightly assume he's a dumbass, but then he actually knows his stuff. It's the mustache, I think. <laughs> um, no, he's extremely smart. He pushes me to my you limits to. Um, and makes me more confident in myself. That's good. All he's a good qualities. dude. He's basically getting her to do stuff when she's tired. So she knows she's not shocked when she's out there. Yeah, that's exactly. I'm trying to get her as tired before. Can she jump that? Three jump. What is the purpose of what you're doing? It's called uh, lactic acid buffering or lactate buffering. And it essentially just prepares your threshold or maybe even increases your lactic threshold. You go out there cold and just prepares you for strenuous exercise. Typically it's really important in shorter workouts, less important in longer workouts, but that loosely applies to CrossFit because there's really nothing in CrossFit that's long where, enough. Where did little. you pick this up? Uh, my coach. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot it? of study and research behind it, a okay. ton, but I like learned the... So you learned it from him, apply it, and realize it works, and now you're passing it on. Correct, yeah. 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 Repackaging it as your own product. And no, it looks like, yeah, essentially, it's his, it's not his product either, you fucker. It's some scientist's product. And I do not like getting science-y, but... I mean, it's backed by science. It is backed by science. Science supports it. Yeah. The way that Tyler explained it to me was, there's a minimum work requirement, except instead of actually work, it's like, you have to be under a certain, basically like a cut line. Yeah. And if you're not inside that cut line, you don't deserve any points. Yeah. Which people will be pissed off about because in their eyes they're like, but the time cap is 15 minutes and I did it in 14.30. Yeah. And his argument is like, yeah, but someone did it in six minutes. Yeah. It's probably less of an issue at like uh, the games level than it is at a local comp. Because if you have a local competition with three elite athletes and a whole bunch of mid-level yeah. quarters to semis athletes, you're gonna have way more disparities. You're gonna have more people that are frustrated by it. But I think what we talked about is like, he's always trying to defend his math and like the math is fine the math is great but it's his message or marketing that can help to steer people in that direction because they're never going to understand the math they just see like i want points zero doesn't make sense if, if i beat you and we both get a zero then we're tied and that doesn't make sense if i beat you yeah what we said is like if the whole thing is is centered around trying to have a more accurate depiction of what the top 10 or what the top of the leaderboard looks like because that's what impacts people's earnings then that's something that I think people understand better. It's like, okay, JR's paying out top three. Like, if he feels very confident that the top 10 fittest people here, who probably did get scores on every event, are ordered appropriately based on their performance, then that's a success. And everybody else, like Castro has said before, he's like, he's trying to find the single fittest person on the earth, on yeah, earth yeah. similar, but in a more inclusive way of like, it's not just participation based, it's based on performance. And this is gonna make sure that if we're paying out top 10, that that's paid out in the right order. It's gonna make sure like, if you're Pat Vellner on the last day of the games when you're trying to make a run to beat Justin, you don't have to worry about getting help from somebody else to middle him. If you just beat him by enough, you can be awarded first place. Sure. If you're a Gi and you're at a semifinal where like you're far and above the fittest guy maybe on every test but one, and 10 guys beat you on one test, like you don't have to worry about that. Or yeah. if you're Chloe competing at the Iron Games and she's probably by f significantly more fit than the majority of the field, but on a long run event, she's not. And she takes 12th on a run because there's a whole bunch of fit people that might not have the skills. Like she's not clawing back over the course of a whole weekend, which is de-incentivizing people like that from doing local competitions because now they're afraid of what it does to their image if they're competing against a local competition field. Whereas if it's performance-based scoring, like you can just slaughter them on the rest of the workouts and it will all work out the way it's supposed to yeah. because you will show that you're the fittest person by how many orders of magnitude. Um, who have you got here? You got Leo and who else? 
I have Leo, Frank Minervini competing, and there's two other underdogs athletes that I'm like helping out with, Robert Yates and then Holly Henderson's in the Masters division. Okay, and how are they all doing? This competition was like for different purposes for everybody. Yeah, I think yeah. it was somebody like Frank, it's competition experience because he's younger and he hasn't done a lot of individual competing. Somebody like Leo is kind of a kick in the butt to like get back into training because he's had some time off and some injuries. What's it like coaching him because sure. like, he, ca step back he came from a very time. different uh, different training methodology and stuff. Yeah. Different, like I'd equate his programming that he was doing, I don't even know it, but just from what I've seen to like aggressive volume to get you to the base level of like, yeah. all right, you're good enough to hold your own. Yeah. Um, and then now, so like he developed habits like, I've seen him doing running workouts at 1 a.m. and stuff and all this kind of stuff. And like, which I assume, like rails totally against your beliefs in training and method, like as in the importance of recovery and all that kind of stuff. We, I shouldn't even say this because I don't want to gas him like that, but we, Justin and I joke that Leo is like our Dennis Rodman on the Bulls, where like if you try to put him in a box and make him act like everybody else, you're just going to fail and he's going to run off and do it anyway. And so it's more about figuring out a way to like meet him in the middle and show support for him and learn more about him so that I can help him get better instead of trying to force him to do things my way. Yeah, um, He's been great. He, when he started with us, he basically said like, he's been training really hard for a few years. He's getting a little burnt out. He's doing everything by himself and missed having like a team and a community aspect. So part of coming to Underdogs was to train with other people and to have eyes on him so in person. So he and Rhino? Yeah, every day. Regularly. Okay, yeah. yeah. And he still works full time. So like a lot of the videos of late night training is because he coaches people in the morning and he coaches people in the evening. So he'll do a session with us midday and then he'll do a session after work some nights if he needs to get his conditioning in. Like, there, I've never, since we started, questioned his work ethic. Um, and so, like, why question anything else about it? Like, if we can keep laying bricks towards our goal. Um, yeah. but he was, like, he took a month off after semis. Then we started working together. He came in with back injury and a shoulder injury. He's had to, like, really slowly build back up, and so, this competition is frustrating for him not because he's still hurt but because he's just not fit like he hasn't had a chance to train enough and so he loves to compete so he wanted to come here just to like be on the floor to have something that kind of like flips the switch in his brain of like okay like i gotta i gotta get my shit back together um and so we're learning more about each other in terms of like coach athlete relationship and competition and now i think we can spend the next six months preparing for semifinals and trying to reach his goal again my eyes are adjusting to the light. Yeah, it's weird being been outside, inside it? the whole time. Oh man, it's been amazing. I feel really happy that we're able to bring the coverage to the you know people who aren't able to be here. I would encourage people to get here at some point if they can. I know it's not the easiest place to get to, but it's oh, a very fuck, cool. If place. I can get here, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter can get here. You guys can get here too. No, it's a, it's a cool place to come. Uh, I've only been here for the team versions in the spring. I've competed here and coached here in the past, so happy to finally get out here for Crucible. Um, and it's great. I mean, you, you know, if you've been able to watch it all, you see the floor layouts are really clean. It's easy to follow. Uh, everything about the logistics organization is meant to be something for athletes to have the opportunity to experience as it would be at the stages of uh, the CrossFit game season that they aspire to be in, whether that's semifinals or the games. Uh, the tests are hard, but they're, they're well written. You know, the, the intent of the stimulus for everyone is kind of well known. The time caps, I think, are appropriate. Um, and you got to, you know, you got to be good at a lot of different things if you're going to uh, podium at this competition. Yeah, the leaderboard has the potential to flip flop after every event, basically. Big time. I mean, we've seen like day one big point guys. swings on one event. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the performance scoring has a lot to do with that, but also the the variance of what's required to excel at event to event. So, mm. um, you, so your summer was one of travel. So you've been to like whatever ten different countries doing like events on. You see, you've had different roles, and at this event, you're doing commentary and like running the live stream basically from on site with Susa. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you want to do all the time? Like, would that be your preferred role to be color commentary or over, like, say, analyzing or over, like, journalistic obligations or whatever? Yeah, I and mean, this is the fifth uh, event, this off stream that I've done the commentary in some capacity for. I have a couple others 
lined up and, and most notably probably Dubai. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I really enjoy it. You know, I, I think that I know a lot about the athletes in the competitive CrossFit scene. I hope that I can convey a good message to people back home about what's happening on the floor, why it's happening. You know, it's uh, the interesting thing about that is that uh, who I'm doing it with is always constantly changing. And so having Joel Gadet at the Pitting Throne is very different. He's got a you know a broadcast background and a lot of experience doing that compared to Savan, who we're doing it on a podcast platform where it's a little bit more light and, and informal. And then in the Iron Games, I did the whole thing by myself, which is not uh, not optimal. So uh, you know the who I'm doing it with and in what um, like level of formality changes a little bit, but the goal remains the same, which is. For anyone who's unable to be here and watch but wants to, and usually it's families, gyms, coaches, uh, that they can have a chance to watch their athletes and then the athletes to be able to go back. And I've spoken to dozens and dozens of them at these competitions who do exactly that, and they go back and watch their performance after the fact to evaluate whether what they thought was happening on the floor is actually what was happening. Well, we had a Kyle Ruth finish on the podium because they were able to watch back the live stream in slow-mo and see that he actually got the reps instead of not getting them. So even that's a vindication of the validity of it. Yeah, having a, a video recording of, uh, of whatever happened on the floor in terms of appeals and processing those is, is critical. Um, you, don't, you can do that without having a live stream, but in this case we're able to use the footage uh, that we have because of the live stream for that, and it has, it has come into play a few times. It's a small competition, so we have a small team here, but we also have a, uh, a quick turnaround time because of that in terms of being able to process those yeah. appeals. A that small team is not a good excuse though, we know that. No, no, it's a good thing in this case yeah. because there's not many steps that it has to go through. It comes immediately to yeah. the people who are making that decision. We watch it, you know, for one to five minutes at most. It's pretty much been a minute or two turnaround and then decisions made and we move on. Small teams move fast. That's right. Yeah. Um, so then moving forward, your role at the games historically has been of like uh, kind of like a consigliere to the commentators like handing little bits of paper little notes little messages of like hey this guy's going to do this or keep an eye on that guy would you rather have someone else do that for you and you be in the hot seat yourself yeah i mean i, I have good relationships with those guys is that the issue that you you have because the sport is so small you have to displace someone to do that yeah, I mean, if you're talking about doing the play-by-play -play or the color commentary at the games, you know, it's been uh, it's been Sean Woodland for over a decade, and then Chase Ingram a majority of the time alongside him. Sometimes they've had a different um, female analyst in there on the women's side. Tanya Wagner has done it. Stacey Tovar this year at the games. Uh, so yeah, and all of those that you know people have big broadcast experience or um, you know have been competitors at the CrossFit Games at a high level and been around for a long time. They present very well on camera, speak well, and uh, yeah, there's just not a lot of room. Yeah. So but you, you want to take someone's job? <laughs> I would love to have the opportunity to do that. I mean, it's, I see people in the comments, it's very nice of them to say that they think we're doing a good job here, and you know, obviously I would hope that people would take note of that, and you know, um, ultimately I want the athletes and the, and the races on the floor to be represented well. Um, and if I can contribute to that in any capacity, I'm happy to do it. And if you know, whoever's making those decisions thinks that I can do it in that seat, then I would love the opportunity, yes. Do you think that other competitions will start taking note of like, well, shit, if JR could do that at Crash, we can do it at, you know, like competitions that have historically avoided doing this kind of thing because they assume it's too expensive, it's too cumbersome, it's too laborsome. Like, do you think now this is an advertisement for like, it's not actually that bad? Yeah, I mean, Zalos Games really last year was was that, and um, you know, this is the second time that the Savon Podcast has been able to host something. But all these commentary or all these uh, broadcasts that I've done outside of Madrid this year are very low budget broadcasts that are being run in a similar fashion with a few amount of people and at a relatively inexpensive cost compared to some of the big time major productions. There's, you know, we miss out on some of the features um, in terms of graphics, rep counters, those types of things. Uh, but you know, we're, I think what we're showing here is that well, we're doing this with mostly phones and computers and the quality has been a little bit uh, up and down, but for the most part good enough. We're getting really good feedback from it and yeah, there, I think there are a lot of competitions out there taking note. There's Will Leahy. William Leahy. We sit down, I go, that's William you Leahy. You made videos about him before. Yes, I have. That's oh. the first time you've met him in person. <laughs> Did he uh, threaten to kill you like the girl at the games? Or make you no. your own dick? No? no. Okay. What was his reaction? It was exactly what I hoped it would be. Which was? He's unaware. He's been in the, he's been in the space for three years. And the big one that everyone will remember is him popping off the row early. Yeah. And everyone who's 
done a workout like that, just knows you don't jump off the row early and tell someone to signal when it rolls over. Yeah. Like Taylor is all the time, you don't do that. But he's 22, he's been in the space for three years, he doesn't have a coach, and he just didn't know. Yeah. And he, he was made alert. He said he didn't really consume my videos the way I wish he would have, but he had people tell him, like, hey dude, so he didn't watch the stuff, he just had people say, hey, this guy made a video about he, you. He brought up the second one that I made, and he goes, it's 10 minutes of Danny Spiegel, where am I? <laughs> Which is okay. funny. So you like him? Yeah. I, uh... He'll probably end up winning the CrossFit Games. Really? Yeah. That dude? Yeah. Based on... Genetics. Headspace. Uh, I really feel like he could use someone like a JR in this corner. Have you said that too? I got time this week and I was thinking it on there. But I think you could do something like JR in this corner, someone who's intelligent, wrote all these workouts, which are some of the best program workouts within a competition, I think. And he doesn't have any of that. Let alone the wherewithal to sit on a rower. Yeah. <laughs> Where does he live? Should have asked him that, I don't know. Yeah. Not Ireland. Would you do it with him? Would I coach him? Yeah. Yeah. That would be an unbelievable story. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That'd be How did you guys cool. meet? Wow. Well, I made this video <laughs> he about... He his roller early. Yeah, it's a, it's a really easy case study. Like, dude, stay, stay, go, yeah. go faster. Yeah. That'd yeah, be cool. he, he has aspirations of winning the games, and I can see it. He told me he does. Like, he's in the space to win. He was gonna be a, he was gonna be a college basketball player. Oh my God, it's like how all over here. Who? Like JR all over again. Right. Could be, yeah, it could be a fit match made in heaven. Yeah. Would you suggest that to JR? I'll talk to him. <laughs> That'd be cool. That's a cool story. Hey, in my opinion, he made Hopper who is who he is. Yeah. Not like Hopper's, of course, Hopper has most to do with it, but of course, there's like the shepherd, you know? Yeah. Where did the sheep go? Where the shepherd tells him? <laughs> if you can mold someone like Hopper, you can probably mold that one. Hey, I, I'm a Hopper fan, by all means. But Lee's got a better skill set from what I've seen. Yeah. He doesn't have the motor, but he's got the gymnastics and he's it's strong as hell. Yeah. Uh, depends on if you're talking to Bergeron or not. <laughs> ben Bergeron, I'll tell you, it's easy to build a motor. You can do it in two weeks. Be yeah. a games athlete in two weeks, as long as you can clean and jerk. Well, there's loads of gravel over there, so if JR does take a while, you can just throw dirt on him. Yeah. Hey, hey, I hear Bergeron's hanging out in this building. He's just getting ready to throw dirt. <laughs>